Welcome to This Team is Killing Us, a podcast about what the Carolina Panthers do to good people. She is Lauren Brownlow. I'm Demetri Ravanis. And what is killing me today, Lauren, is that, again, the gynocracy rules and straight white men cannot catch a break. We come off of another day celebrating women. Just killing me. Did you have a happy Mother's Day? <laughs> Yeah, it was good. I I, I didn't hear uh, Wins Kids Day yesterday, but I have heard that. Really? I heard it yesterday like, from both kids. And I'm just like, <laughs> y'all really don't. And I'm like, wow, life's come full circle, A. Because <laughs> remember saying that to my own parents. Of course. And then B, like, wow, they really don't know that every day's Kids Day, do they? <laughs> It is it is amazing the moment you realize how much was lost on you by virtue of how much is lost on them. Yeah, it's it's freaky when you hear yourself saying things that your parents literally said to you and you you see your yeah. kid responding the same way you did. And you're like. As I was putting together the rundown for today's show, the NFL inundated me with ads saying that moms want nothing more than a pink Carolina Panthers jersey for uh, for Mother's Day. You don't own a pink jersey of any sort, right? No, okay. and I won't. I, I didn't think so. I just didn't know if perhaps what was gifted to you that has stayed in the rotation. You know, I never know. I'm I'm not judging, by the way. Like some people sure. are like super. I've I've never like even as like a color to not wear sports clothes. I'm not super into. I, I'll wear it sometimes. I did wear it yesterday. I leaned in to the pink, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I don't. For me, it's like, are the Panthers colors pink? Right. No, then I'm good. Like, right. what? Uh, even though, even though I, uh, I go the opposite way. I, I love a good pink shirt. I, in fact, would tell you that whether it is Messi's, um, that is uh, good looking. Messi yeah. signing with, uh, yeah, with Miami FC. Do you remember when Florida International did their, uh, their Miami Vice helmet that was, uh, had like the neon blue and neon pink on it? Like, I think we've been missing out on pink as a team color in sports because we've been conditioned to believe it's feminine. Well, obviously, but we're not getting past that barrier anytime. And by the way, why why is that the only color we get? Well, you Some get of purple. us like other colors. No, you get purple. I was see, I, think, I knew I knew you were gonna say that. And I'm like, I, no, listen, I, I like a good purple. I like a good I, I had this purple. argument with a friend yesterday because uh we uh we both enjoy the old aesthetic of the old Ford Bronco and I saw one uh painted like a a paisley purple and I said this thing is gorgeous and he uh responded that it was a chick color and I passionately defended a light purple you know my my own child has said that to me and I'm like yeah. that's there's no such thing as colors for men and women it's not <laughs> working I'm doing my best no, I understand. Uh, I was thinking about this yesterday as I was inundated with uh, Carolina Panthers for women ads. Uh, do you think Dave Tepper would like for us to all recognize Nicole as like the team mom? Do you think he looks at like Terry Saban in Alabama or like Mrs. Bowden? I could never remember what her name was. The way she was around Florida State players where they all sort of point to her as equally as influential and responsible for them growing as people as the coach was. I maybe, but at the same time, like not to usurp himself. So yeah, maybe, I would agree with that. You well, know that's, I mean? that's so, why that's yeah. why I'm saying like not she would like he would like her to be recognized as an owner, but as team mom. But see, here's the thing: if she's recognized as team mom in that way, then she's automatically more well liked than he is. So. Okay, so that gets to my next question: Do you think the fan base right now likes her or even feels neutral about her? Do you think the name Tepper? And Dave's actions are damaging enough that we cannot separate them. I mean, if we're talking about the misogynists amongst the fan base, which I don't even want to yeah. speculate as to what percentage that would be. Uh, however, uh, you know, they're automatically going to associate a wife with the deeds of her husband, no matter mm -hmm. what. Um, and so I think that there is like a degree of guilt by association. Even the ones who aren't necessarily misogynist were conditioned to feel that way, right? Like you're responsible for your uh, husband's behavior somehow. So you're right. also guilty or whatever, because I guess, I don't know, because you stay with him. Well, yeah, behind any, behind any good man, dot, 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 as they say. 
Oh, uh, sure, sure, sure. But like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for the most part, like I personally, I don't really think one thing or another about yeah, her because I, I don't feel like I know her at all. So, <laughs> right? No, I'm I'm the same. I wonder yeah. how many Carolina Panthers fans. Let's let's divorce um, Dave's extracurricular actions. I, and I'm talking about you know throwing the drink and stuff like that. You know, going to the to the bar to fight, all that kind of stuff. I, I don't need anything else. But no, just to Karen, not to fight. <laughs> yes. Um, all right, so let's dismiss that um, and dismiss the way anybody in the Carolina Panthers fan base might feel about a woman in power in general. I do wonder how much of C.J. Stroud versus Bryce Young oh, and how well, important she was in that decision sticks with it. I mean, maybe, but the thing is, like – Tepper has done whatever he wants regardless anyway yeah. of like, and I think most of us still put more on him when it comes to I, that. I think so but too. I, I think so too. I think there is a, I, you know, the only words I can come up with are anti Tepper bias. And that makes it sound like it's not earned. It is very well earned, right? Like yeah. we have strong feelings about Dave Tepper that I think Nicole just cannot overcome. Yeah. No matter, no matter what, like she could become the leader in uh, philanthropy for uh, Charlotte and, and it's not going to change. Yeah, I, now, I'll say I'm this, she has out. a chance to be liked. I don't think she has a chance to be loved as long as yeah. uh, David Tipper is like this, which seemingly is just who he is. But I, I think she has the potential to be like either tolerated or largely yeah. ignored, which is probably about the best she could hope for. To be fair... Uh, she also is quick to throw around bringing music to Charlotte. Wow. I think I, I think that's really important to point out that it's not listen, uh, it, it's not disconnect on one side and woman of the people on the other. Listen, that's just, that's also just some of that is like a north a, a northern thing when they move yeah. here. I mean, let's be yeah. honest. Remember, remember how much and look, I like Wegmans a lot. But do you remember how much everyone oh, freaked sure. out when Wegman? You guys have no idea. This, you've never seen a grocery store like this. <laughs> You don't even know. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Calm hey. down. Yeah. We, have you seen the bigger Harris Teeters? Have you Publix seen Publix? Got here first. It was considerably yeah. better. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I like Wegmans a lot too, but you know, whatever. I mean, it's fine. Either way, sure. it's like, we get it. You guys bring everything cool here. Why did you come here then if we don't have anything? Yeah. Weird. All right. Let's, uh, let's pivot a bit here from debating whether we like someone or not to... America's new sweetheart. The thing about football that's so that's changed oh, now. Hang on. Oh, wrong sweetheart. Here's <laughs> to America's sweetheart. No, oh, no, nah, nah. see, I ain't never had a job for real. I'll be the 2020 with COVID. He, one of my partners was working at KSC. And I, I, I went in there. He kept begging me to cook because I was just chilling at the house. I went in there about two weeks and I got on though. <laughs> so, oh, no, nah, no, nah, see, I ain't never. That is, uh, that is Xavier Leggett. I Lauren. lasted nine seconds in that clip this time. I timed myself because I saw that on Twitter. And I, I was like, wow. At first when he starts talking, I'm like, wow, I understand it all. And then <laughs> I think I compared it the last time to like listening to uh, Puerto Rican Spanish, which is very fast mm. to me. Right. As someone who's taken Spanish my whole life. And I can understand a little better like when I'm in, for instance, Mexico. Right. Because they don't – I mean, sometimes like – they just the Puerto Ricans that I know speak so fast. It all sound, starts to sound like one word blending together. <laughs> and so I, I lasted until he said, and I, I, I checked the captions to cheat begging. Uh, my friend was begging me to come in and I was like, Oh, and then I lost it. And when it all starts blending together like that, it's like, you can't get the word back. You know? Uh, you <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm with you. And if I had not seen it written out, I think I would have had trouble understanding too, but I have decided Lauren, uh, if you do not like Xavier Leggett, I kind of want to beat you up. Yeah, I love him. He's great. It's, it's not just the accent. Like, I think the... Oh, the accent's uh, a lot, though. It's great. Oh, no, the accent, and I think certainly it's that it, it reinforces the local ties, right? Like, it reinforces just how much this is a Carolina guy. But I think the expectations are kind of really high for, what, the fifth or sixth wide receiver taken in this draft, like I, I think he is coming into the season expected to do for the Panthers what Malik Neighbors is expected to do for the Giants. Well, you know, good Lord willing, right? Because, yeah, yeah. Uh, they need it certainly. Um, I, you know me; I'm afraid to hope ever. 
And I have seen a lot of wide receivers, some of which I really liked coming Mm -hmm. out of the draft or or whatever that were supposed to be the next saviors come in and, and really stink. And so for me, I'm just, look, I'm afraid to love. I've been hurt too many times. (laughs) I'm afraid to open up my heart and let myself be vulnerable until I see a little bit of proof of concept. That's just the way I'm going to have to approach it. Now, the best they can hope for out of me is what they currently have, which is that I don't feel an intense sense of dread yeah. to uh, watch them play football and to see what Xavier can do. I do not feel dread. I feel happy. I like him very much so far. I would like to hear him talk all the time. Because I feel like <laughs> I'll get, just like listening to Puerto Rican Spanish, I'll get better at understanding it the more exposure I have to it. <laughs> and but every now and then I'm still going to have a, a sentence where he loses me at a word and I'm I'm gone for the rest of the sentence. It's it's interesting. I've been paying attention to a lot of the interviews coming out of rookie minicamp with all of these guys and listening to the people covering camp talk. There is an expectation that he is going to be lined up across from Deontay Johnson and it will be um yeah uh, it, it will be uh. Oh, Jesus. Why is my brain fart? The only reliable receiver. Adam Thielen. Um, right. I was like, don't slot. forget about Thielen now. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that's okay. He, we, you can. He, they can. He's the one moving can. into the slot. And the other thing is, like, it seems to be almost a foregone conclusion that Jatavian Sanders is at the top of the tight end depth chart right now. Yeah. They're and really, I don't know if that's fair or not, but I hope that's true. They're really liking him so far. Wouldn't it be nice to have a tight end that can catch this year? That'd be wild. Agreed. I didn't know Agreed. that was allowed. <laughs> especially someone that can not only catch but can catch over the middle and be relied on to hang on to the ball after yeah, said hit adam thielen's like oh thank god another <laughs> one. thank you <laughs> well uh i tell you what i want to talk about the other rookie offensive weapon in just a second but first i do want to remind people we have the first ever sports podcast festival presented by our friends at breeze through coming up uh, on August the 24th, tickets are on sale in less than two weeks through Etix. Follow at Sports Pod Fest on social media, both Twitter and Instagram, for updates there. And even though that is Ovius and Gilio hand in the dirt and shut down full cast, Lauren and I will be involved uh, in the night th- throughout. So please yeah. come and join us and pay attention uh, to those ticket updates. And thanks to our friends at Breeze Through for making the whole thing possible. And of course, we tell you this each and every week. Go to wherever it is you are listening to or watching this right now and do three things. Like the video or audio. Subscribe if you are not done so already. And leave a comment so more Panthers fans around the Carolinas, around the country, can find this team is killing us. Those comments help push us up in the algorithm for uh, people that may not be familiar with the show already. All right, Lauren, I don't want to just focus on Jonathan Brooks. I want to focus on the running back room in full because, holy crap, do we have a lot of running backs right now? Yeah, good thing they traded up to get one, you know? It's really... I would I would say that Brooks is probably the most gifted of all of them, but you've now got, if you include what Chuba did last year, You've now got four guys that have shown the capability to be the primary back, and that feels way overcrowded. Also, like, look, am I one of those people that thinks running back is completely obsolete? Of course not. Yeah, I'm not. However, do I understand why there's less of an emphasis on running backs now? Yeah, I do. And so I look at this and I just, I'm a little, I, I don't love it. I just don't. Um, No matter what, like, I know he might be the most gifted, but, you know, he's got an injury history, too. And and then Miles, Miles, like, there's nobody except Chuba. And because Chuba was literally half the time I would watch an entire Panthers game and he was the only person to bring me any happiness the entire time. (laughs) So I will always, like, have love for him for that reason. And he always ran so hard, you know, Mm. And, and I love that about him. Is he like the solution as a number one back? No, I and I understand that. But at the same time, like, I don't know. I just, I, I can't, it, it's just kind of hard for me to, to, you know, get all that excited about even if, about the room, because I just don't know how many of those guys we need. And especially because as we've talked about, it's like they still don't seem to think they have a left tackle problem, right. which, okay, good yeah, luck. I mean, 
<laughs> which I, I think was the motivation for bringing in a guy like Richard Penny, who had played, yeah. uh, you can't say for Dave Canales in Seattle because Canales was only the quarterback's coach, but he recognized that Penny was a pretty skilled pass blocker in the backfield. And that probably explains why he's there now. Um, and it probably explains why Tariq Cohen is not there since he, I know, it's really disappointing. Love because, dude, if you, love Tariq. if you remember the Celebration Bowl where A&T played, I want to say. I'm trying to, I can't remember off the top of my head now. Yeah, now I can't remember either. Might have been Alabama State. That might not be right, though. Um, anyway, the, the Celebration Bowl he played in his senior year and started, he, before the injuries, was a speed threat. Right. And I would think if they thought that he was capable of getting that back in any form, he would be ideal for the third or fourth running back in a rotation. They clearly don't think he's got NFL reps in him anymore, unfortunately. Alcorn State, by the way. Alcorn which State. I'm yeah. pretty sure, isn't that Steve McNair's? Uh, alma that was. Yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I yeah, the injuries. It just stinks. It stinks. It, it's a reality of playing that position in this league. And I understand. I, I mean, that, there's your answer to why running back has been so devalued, right? Like, and then they bring in one old. with the history, so that's yep. fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's going to be interesting. But Eric Eager, who is now in charge of analytics for the Carolina Panthers, uh, he was on with our buddy Ross Tucker. The new episode of the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, and I, I want you to hear sort of his philosophy on what the value of offensive drives are. And I think this will tell you a lot about why the running back room is so full and why they invested so much in the middle of the offensive line. The, the thing about football that's so that's changed now, when you've watched, like, you you you're do the betting, you know, like, totals in this league have been a joke, right? You know, the, the games go under, and they don't go under – they go under in Patrick Mahomes games. They don't even go. They not do. They don't just just don't go under because the quarterbacks all suck. They go under in Lamar Jackson games. They go right. under. Pat, and the reason is there's not that many possessions anymore. Teams are just as good now at picking up first downs. They're not as good at scoring touchdowns as they used to be because these defenses are playing those Better two in high the red zone yeah. and the and the two high shell. Yeah. So so if you're thinking about in this league, there's such a premium on possession, right there, and so. Because you're not going to get big plays. So if you're the Lions, it's not just 14 to 17 to 21. It's 14. And even if you go down and miss a miss a fourth and one at the one yard line, you've taken three more minutes off the clock. And you're and when you're up on a team like the Niners that is actually explosive, your goal is to take more time off the clock. And that right. to me, that's that's even the secondary benefit that I think a lot of us, when we think about the immediacy of it, we miss because the control of the clock is is the big part. And when you have the ball, you control the clock so much better. And we saw that in the Lions Rams game earlier, where McVay lost all of his timeouts, and so the Lions had the ball at the end of the game. And even though the Rams had kind of all the momentum, it's like, well, McVay can't really do anything no. because he doesn't have timeouts. And the Lions, as much as they're uphill the rest of this game, they have the ball. Hanging on to the ball, as much as you know that I like Bryce Young and think he will eventually be okay hanging on to the ball and taking time off the clock seems like the way you have to approach things if you're the Panthers given the state of the roster right now yeah and and look he, he's right I yeah. don't think that's by the way and I know everyone thinks like the NFL is bulletproof and everything but personally I think the NFL turning into Iowa football is not <laughs> ideal yeah for viewership long term because people <laughs> will eventually just be like screw this this right. is Awful. And right. I think, too, like what has happened is a lot of rules flipped in favor of the offense for a while. And, and I think uh, defenses were having a hard time adjusting to that. I think in general in this league and certainly now, the better coaches, in my opinion, are on that side of the ball. Mm -hmm. And the good offensive minds, I think, are discouraged from risk taking. A lot of the time, even the fourth. I mean, just think about how controversial the fourth down thing was. So it was nice to hear him say that, like, that's a strategy that makes even ball possession offense mm -hmm. like better for you to go for fourth downs just to keep at least to keep the clock moving if nothing else yeah. you just keep it out of their hands like you go for it and you don't get it so what like at least you ran one more play and you put yourself in a position to get yourself an even better payoff as opposed to just you know 
punting after you went three and out for, or, or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, or, or trying a sand field goal. Um, well, yeah. and that's one of the things that he talked about and I didn't want to play like the whole seven minute clip, but one of the things that Eric eager talked about with uh, Ross Tucker is that you have to give Dan Campbell a lot of credit in that sure. NFC championship game for not only being willing to go, but when he does kick the field goal and it misses, he says the decision is on me. He doesn't just say, oh, I like to make so those. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it is um, an it element. Like we didn't execute or whatever. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, and so I wonder if the idea of stacking up on, I'll say the run game, because I do include the additions on the offensive line to that. I, I wonder if that is a element of Dan Morgan sort of giving Dave Canales every opportunity to call the game he wants to so that Dave cannot pin it on we don't have the people we we don't have the right mix here yeah I think there's some of that I also think like you said it's understanding the personnel that you have and then um but I do think at a certain point and I understand the need for possession and all of that at a certain point though I believe this like you inherently you have to take you have to be able to take risks. You have to be able, you have to have someone on your roster that can get a big play or yeah. else it won't matter how many running backs you have or like, because defenses can literally just outnumber you if they know right. you're not going deep. Like we saw it all last year. Like, and so I think that's something that I, I hear you on the, I hear them on the off the ball possession part and it is going to be important. But at a certain point, and, and I think we'll start to see things like swing back in this direction because really the offenses were quite sad in general last year. <laughs> so for the Panthers to be the saddest of a very sad bunch was all, was even worse, really. To but still, it was like you know you've got to you got to figure out something to make an explosive play, and you can't just hope to dink and dunk your way down the field because a lot of things can go wrong. You might get a holding penalty. Somebody might mess something. It demands what it does, and you see this a lot from defensive coaches even in college football. They they want to employ that kind of strategy, kind of like let's get the chunk, let's get dink and dunk down the field a little bit mm -hmm. and not take any huge risks and, and prioritize ball security. I think you have to have a balance there at least a little bit or else it becomes too difficult because you're going to mess up. You're going to, someone's going to mess something up at one point and it's yeah. going to be too hard to get it back on that drive or just you become too predictable and yeah. easy to defend. Uh, Lauren, please give the Panthers some credit. They were the second worst of, uh, of the worst when it comes to Which is bad. Which last is year. How? <laughs> well, yeah, who was no, okay. the Giants? Uh, was it the Giants or the Jets? It was one of the New the York Jets, teams. Right? I think it was the Jets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's wrap up this conversation real quick with like, you've got to assume at this point, another cut is coming, right? Like it, it just, to me, it seems like a no brainer. Miles Sanders contract is ripe yeah. for cutting to get under the cap if you need to. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Yes, ex <laughs> exactly. And, and, uh, and I'm, I still am sorry to him for the beginning of last year because I did not know he was banged up. So. I see. I'm going to go the other way with it. Uh, thank you for your half season of service uh, here in a Carolina Panthers uniform, Miles Sanders. Uh, Lord Brownlow, did you see, uh, as people maybe can make out the uh, the edge of the Go ACC um, wall art you have, did you see former Duke star Austin Rivers uh, comment about NBA players versus NFL players? Listen, Austin has never been afraid to say exactly whatever the hell it is on his mind, which is something I kind of have always dug about him. Yeah. Even when he, even when it's going to be something that people are going to be like, are you an idiot? It, you yeah. know, it doesn't, he does not care. Uh, um, Austin river yeah. said just for people that missed it, that there are maybe 30 guys in the NBA that could play in the NFL right now. And there are nowhere close to 30 NFL players that could play in the NBA. Um, I know I what he's saying. I don't think he's wrong. Right, because it, what people don't understand about that, right, is that like, okay, well, what do you mean? Like, they're athletes and whatever, and, and they can, yes, but you have to understand, the NBA is a highly skilled game still, right? regardless of what people want to say about it, and especially people that don't watch it night in and night out. Yeah, like, especially now. You're a college hoop person, yeah. right? 
watch a game in the playoffs and watch how many shots you watch in college that you expect guys to miss a lot more that they just drain as and, and not touch anything but just straight through the net swish it barely moves in the nba watch how you many know? watch how many times an nba team shoots and then don't send anyone down for an offensive rebound cuz they don't yep. they're so confident they don't need to but the other thing is Along those lines, it's such a skilled game. And this is not taking away from football players at all. Certain positions on the field involve high amounts of skill. But you can find a spot on a roster just by being a goon. That's not the case anymore in the NBA. Right. And the thing is, we've seen basketball players transition. Now, granted, they didn't like just come not a lot of them came straight out of basketball. They some of them played in college at least a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, transitioned in that way, but you, I mean, how often do you see it the other way where a guy that, you know, comes from college football specifically, I mean, people get enamored with LeBron. LeBron is a one of a kind athlete, pure and simple. Like he is other world. Like there's not a lot of guys built like him in the NBA or the NFL. (laughs) But here's, here's where LeBron is like a lot of other guys in the NFL when it comes to football. Um, he had an amazing high school football career, but right. just like Allen Iverson, just like Jalen Brunson, what they could have done if they had gone to the next level is largely theoretical, right? Like, exactly. yeah, like Allen Iverson is talked about as maybe the best quarterback in the history of Virginia high school football. And I don't just say a lot considering it, it, it certainly is. I don't doubt that that's true. I am. I am, by the way, an A.I. Apologist. That is my all time favorite. You love him. Yeah, he's great. I do. Yeah. Um, that being said, you know, he is a little undersized by quarterback standards. The, at the time he was playing, it was not really the way he played because he is described as being a Michael Vick type, required a very specific type of offensive coordinator. We don't really know what he would have been yeah. in college, let alone the NFL. So I, I do think. The idea that these guys can just jump between sports is a little bit crazy. However, I can see how there are more basketball players that could make the move and find a spot on an NFL roster, that's, that's even just, a UFL well, okay, roster. Let me give you an example, right? Would you, just because they're all great athletes, would you say that any player on the NFL roster could be your kicker? No. no. Yeah, and, and that's not because a kicker is so much of a superior athlete to, right. a, you know, anybody else. It's because it's a very specialized skill set, right? Yeah. I mean, look, kicking, kicking sort of jogs my memory here on this. Do you remember in, oh, shoot, what was the World Cup recently where the U.S. had such a poor showing? Was it, oh, I think it might have been, I think it might have been 16 when we, j- or 18 when we just didn't make the World Cup at all. There was all this discussion about someone like Kobe Bryant, who is an absurdly talented athlete who, by the way, spent time growing up in Italy and loved soccer. If that had been his focus, you know, how much of a difference maker could he have been? And, you know, I kept coming back to probably a lot if that had been his focus. You are not taking him off the court to put him on the soccer field right now. That's not that simple either for that. Does that mean that they're better athletes? No, it's just a completely different set of conditioning skill sets like literal yeah. skill sets it's so i do agree with him to be honest like i agree with austin but i also understand why people freak out because especially like nfl fans because their ability to understand nuance is um well uh limited <laughs> yeah it's limited i would i would go so far as to say right now man bryce might be the guy with the most skill but obviously the 5'10 point guards at the NBA are, are few and far between to the point that we could probably name them. All. Yeah, I, I, right? I, 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 he's too short. I, I think, uh, I mean, I would think Xavier Leggett, maybe. But again, like I, who on the Panthers roster right now do you look at and go, he's got an NBA body? Well, listen, I have a type, as you know. <laughs> sure, sure. So as much as I want to go in different directions, I just can't help but think – about my guy, Derek Brown. <laughs> I want to see him in the post. I need that in right. my life. 6'5", 320. Like, he, if he has the post, the 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 the, the feet of a DJ right. Burns, and they can te- teach him a spin, like, he has some spin moves. I think that that is an easily translatable skill. How many, how much can he go up and down the court? I don't know. 
you know, but <laughs> at the same time, I want, I need that in my life. I, I also was thinking a little bit about Johnny Hecker. I didn't know he was six, five. Oh, I didn't know he was six, five either. Six, five. I, I, He's I love those dudes, especially, especially Brown. Like you are talking about someone you want to play like a Nikola Jokic or a Rudy Gobert, but literally seven inches shorter. Like that's, that's a tough sell, right? Yeah. I hear you. That's uh, before yeah, that'd be an get... extremely undersized big man. <laughs> right. <laughs> Before extreme... we get off of this, you said you don't often hear about guys going from the football field uh, directly into pro basketball. It's not the NBA, but did you see the Devin Funches story? Uh, he, yeah, he, well, or I, I think I remember something about this, but refreshed my memory. Yeah. And I, so... should, I should shout out, by the way, not to completely di diverge, but, uh, but I should shout out Julius Peppers. But to be fair, he spent his whole life playing basketball, right. but I was so impressed with his skill when he played college basketball. I was just like, how is he this good at everything? But anyway, yeah. Uh, so Devin Funches is 29 years old. He just agreed to a deal with the Caribbean Storm Llaneros of professional Columbia basketball. Uh, and he said that he has what seems like an attainable goal. He would like to play at least one game That's for awesome. the Greensboro Swarm. Like he just wants to make it to the G League. And he specifically said, Greensboro because he said while I'm from Michigan and certainly people know me from my time at Michigan I've never felt love from a community like I did from Carolina Panthers fans I'd love to play just one game for the Hornets G League affiliate and here I a monster was about to say he's <laughs> finally found a sport where it's okay to drop the ball <laughs> sorry Devin 